Welcome to Oil & Gas with Energy Law Prof. Today we're going to talk about what's usually the first paragraph of the lease, which is the granting clause. So the granting clause defines what rights are given to explore for and produce oil and gas. Typically it's not going to impose any obligation on the oil and gas company. It's just going to give the oil and gas company the exclusive right or option to drill for oil and gas. Now, when you're looking at a granting clause, as we'll talk about, you're going to look for what kind of substances are covered. Obviously, it's almost always going to cover both oil and gas, but does it cover any other minerals? We're going to look at what land in specific it covers. Does it cover the landowner's full piece of land or just a part of it? And also the size of the interest, because sometimes the person granting the lease won't own the full mineral interest. They may just own a fraction. They may own just one-tenth or one-twentieth of the mineral interest and they may be leasing their full uh, one-tenth or one-twentieth or maybe they own the full mineral interest and they're leasing the whole thing. Now here's an example granting clause from the Producers 88 uh, example lease that I gave you. So the lessor in consideration of X dollars in hand paid of the royalties herein provided and of the agreements of the lessee herein contained hereby grants, leases, and lets exclusively unto the lessee for the purposes of investigating, exploring, prospecting, drilling, and mining for and producing oil and gas and all other minerals, conducting exploration, et cetera, et cetera, the following described land in Blank County, Texas to wit. Okay, so note that this example granting clause includes a blank for the amount of bonus that's going to be paid because typically that would be negotiated and a blank for what land is described because that's where the landowner is going to describe the actual land that they're leasing to the oil and gas company. Now when you look at that granting clause, you want to look at what kind of surface uses are permitted. Uh, there will typically be a lot of things listed, some of those would be implied even if they weren't listed, like the right to explore, the right to produce oil and gas. But you want to look for anything uh, in particular that's described that you know changes what you would normally imply about the oil and gas company's right to go on the land and produce oil and gas. As we dis discussed, and as we'll discuss more in a later class, you also want to look for what substances are covered. Yeah, it probably covers oil and gas, but does it cover other minerals, etc.? Would it cover coal? Would it cover gold or uranium if that was found? Then you want to look at what land is covered. So what's the description of the land covered? Sometimes there might be a mistake where the description of the land covered is different than the description of the property, but really the landowner intended to lease his or her whole property. In that case, you might want to sort of protect yourself by including a Mother Hubbard clause, which basically says, I intended to grant a lease to my whole property. Uh, you also want to look at what interests are covered. As we discussed, it could be the full 100% mineral interest in the land, but it also could be a smaller portion, maybe just a 120th mineral interest. Or maybe you think you have a 120th mineral interest, but really all you have is a 140th mineral interest. In that case, something like a proportionate reduction clause, which we'll talk about later, would protect the oil and gas company that uh, thought it was leasing a 120th interest, but only got a 140th interest. All right. First case, Hunt versus Kerbaugh. It's from North Dakota, 1979, page 169. In this case, the oil and gas company offers the landowner some money to explore. So the oil and gas company has a lease on the land. That's why we say it's the lessee. And it offers the landowner some money to explore. But Kerbaugh rejects it because Kerbaugh says, you know what, last time you were on my land exploring for oil and gas, you damaged a spring. So what does Hunt do at that point? They say, under the lease, I have the right to come on to your property. And so they file for injunctive relief, that right to go on the property. Kerbaugh says, wait a second, you don't have an unlimited right to go onto my property, especially when you've already damaged uh, some of my land. But the court says, no, the right to come on your property and explore was implied in the lease. There is an implied right to use the surface as reasonably necessary to obtain the minerals. That's just impliedly included in every lease. Now there can be limits on that implied easement. One is actually already stated in that court decision, which is that you have to use it 
reasonably. So you don't have the right to just build an unlimited size parking lot on that land for any equipment you may or may not need to put there. You have the right to build you know, a reasonably big parking lot for whatever equipment you need to produce oil and gas. The implied right is also limited by the accommodation doctrine, which says, look, you can't just knock over the landowner's house and put your oil and gas well there. Generally, if you, if you are able to do so, you have to accommodate existing structures on the land and existing uses of the land. Okay, here's another limit that's important is that typically that implied right is only to develop the land for purposes of extracting oil and gas on that piece of property. So if you want to put a storage facility for oil to store the oil from a well on that piece of land, fine. If you want to put a pipeline to pump that oil off of that land, fine. But if you want to put a storage facility to store all your oil from every well that you have in a bunch of different properties in that county, that's a problem because that's not for the benefit of oil and gas production on that particular mineral estate. So if as an oil and gas company, you want the right to build storage facilities to benefit neighboring properties, you're gonna to wanna to negotiate for that and put it in your lease. Okay, the other way that this implied easement can be limited is by the terms of the lease. This can go very far. As we saw in the Lightning versus Anadarko case, in that case, the state of Texas just said, you know what, I don't want you drilling on my land as at all. You get a lease, you have the right to produce oil and gas for my property, but if you're gonna produce it, you better find a neighbor where you can drill on their land, drill horizontally and produce the oil and gas from my land. Because you have no right to drill on my land. So you can have that kind of limitation in the lease that says the oil and gas company can only drill on certain parts of the property, can't drill on the property at all, they have to pay for damages if they drill, etc. cetera. Um, there also may be laws, regulations, or ordinances that limit the right of the oil and gas company to come on and produce oil and gas where they have a lease. One very common state limit is to say, you know what, oil and gas companies, you can come on and produce, but you have to pay for the damages that you cause to the landowner. Okay, I mentioned briefly the accommodation doctrine. What is that? Well, the accommodation doctrine says that if the mineral interest owner's use of the land or the oil and gas lessee, oil and gas companies use of the land substantially interferes with the surface owner, owner's existing use, then the mineral owner has to accommodate that existing use if there are reasonable alternatives. So, you know, this is why you can't knock down the landowner's house or barn if you have other places that you can drill that well, because that would substantially interfere with that existing use of the land. So the accommodation doctrine is often gonna protect uh, the landowner's structures, et cetera. Okay, flip side, what happens if the landowner resists the oil and gas company's implied right to come on and produce oil and gas? Because you know it turns out the, oil, the landowner often has a practical ability to make things very different for the oil and gas company, very difficult for them. So they can you know, block access to roads, make it very hard to get equipment on, et cetera. So if the landowner obstructs the oil and gas company's quiet enjoyment of the lease, their ability to come on and explore for and produce oil, often equity is going to toll the running of time under the lease. So even though the lease may only have a given amount of time to drill in the primary term, uh, that period of time will be extended if the oil and gas company couldn't access the land because of obstruction by the surface owner. The obstruction doctrine can also be triggered if the surface owner denies that the oil and gas company has title. Because if the oil and gas company is afraid that it might lose title because it's being contested by the surface owner, it may not wanna go and drill until that's cleared up. So the surface owners denying title, denying that the oil and gas company has a proper lease can toll the running of the primary term, which would otherwise uh, eventually cut off the oil and gas company's option to drill. Okay. I showed you this granting clause before, uh, but one thing I want you to think about is, remember, 
Think about this Hunt versus Kerbaugh case. The right to come on and explore for oil and gas uh, and to produce oil and gas is implied by the lease. Now, isn't it interesting that in the lease, it also explicitly states these rights. It says that the oil and gas company can come on and investigate, explore, prospect, drill and mine, uh, conduct exploration, etc. Why do you suppose that oil and gas companies put this in the lease if it would be implied anyway by the court? Well, the basic answer is that it really gives notice to the landowner. And it's a little bit helpful if you can go to the landowner and say, see, look, you signed this. This was implied by the lease itself, my right to come on and produce. But you also explicitly agreed to my right to come and look for oil and gas and produce oil and gas uh, on your surface from the uh, minerals underlying your land. Okay, uh, last issue on the granting clause. As I mentioned, sometimes a situation arises where the description of the land in the oil and gas lease doesn't exactly match the description of the land in the property deed, but the intent of the owner was to lease his or her full plot of land. So if you're doing that, sometimes you'll include a Mother Hubbard clause, which basically uh, just says, look, I intended to lease the full property. Here's an example Mother Hubbard clause. This lease also covers and includes any and all lands owned or claimed by the lessor adjacent or contiguous to the land described here and above, whether the same be in said survey or surveys or in adjacent surveys, although not included uh, within the boundaries of the land described above. So let me give you a common scenario. Imagine that you have a square property in the described in the lease, but actually if you look at it, there's a little corner of the property that extends out because there is a river bend included. So that little triangle here would not be included in the description in the lease. And so the Mother Hubbard clause would say, no, 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 that's adjacent to what I described. I meant to include that. By the way, you know, go and check out the Mother Hubbard poem and see if you think that makes sense. Basically, the idea is uh, Mother Hubbard keeps going to the cupboard looking for something, but it's not what's required in the situation. So I think the idea of the Mother Hubbard clause is that this is basically designed to protect you when what you described in the lease isn't exactly what you meant to describe. Okay, this second clause we'll talk about right now is the in gross clause. As we'll talk about when we talk about delay rentals, uh, it can be helpful. There can be big problems that arise when you calculate payments that are made under the lease on the basis of acreage, but the description of acreage is wrong. An ingross clause is designed to protect you in that circumstance. And what it says is, for the purpose of calculating rental payments here and after provided for the lands covered hereby are estimated to comprise however many acres whether it actually comprises more or less. So that basically says, look, if I describe this land wrong and it's really more acres or less acres, it doesn't matter. I'm gonna be making the same rental payments. And as we'll see in later classes, that can really help you in circumstances where the precise calculation of rental payments is very important.